So for the first part of our panel discussion this morning, we'll talk about trends. We'll start with Tesla, with the Ms. Uh, Charlene Justin Baste. Let's talk about the alignment of the trends that you have observed, let's say in the Philippines or even globally, and how aligned are these trends with the training that you conduct at Tesla? Can, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, pleasant morning. Still a morning. So pleasant morning to everyone. Yes, thank you for that uh, For that question. Actually, um, we're trying. We, it's really good to see those trends uh, at the international level because um, actually uh, for TESDA, we, are, we really uh, ensure that we are really demand-driven since we are TVET, Technical Vocational Education and Training, should really be responsive to the changing and the flexible needs of the market. So we have, uh, we are looking at all of these trends and um, we closely monitor this evolving job market and to align our programs to the demand. And uh, currently, of course, uh, we're doing a lot of, uh, we're doing some researches as well as part of our work to really align our programs. So we have done some skills needs anticipation and the workforce skills through the workforce skills survey. And we've really seen um, evolving demand for the digital skills for the health, there's also for agriculture and construction and the tourism sector. So we have seen emerging demands for these uh, sectors. And of course, at the national, we're also looking at the trend, um, the, the economic sectors. Of course, there's really uh, higher demand or increasing demand for the services sector. So those are things that we are looking at. And we'd also like to, uh, we have now the national TSD plan, which we have recently launched. And this plan really envisions a globally recognized event that is really responsive for, that is responding to lifelong learning and transformation for the socioeconomic transformation of the country. So these are the things that I think um, as part of the education sector should really be doing. We have to be uh, responsive, uh, especially this uh, dual transition. The NTSDP is actually looking at, uh, I, mean, I mean, even before, uh, we have been discussing about this. We have developed the green greening, the technical vocation and education framework. We actually having this framework so that we are able to uh, develop our training regulations or standards that is responsive to what the industry needs, especially for the green, the green economy or the circular economy. And then in terms of the digital transition, um, some of our we have embedded uh, the digital skills. And some of our trainers are also trained in terms of doing the digital, uh, having the digital competency so that they'll be able to transform this to our uh, students, our learners in general. So uh, basically, um, I think we're, we're somehow ready. We're, we have this in the plan. Uh, the dual transition is part of our priority. Um, uh, we have uh, the different modalities as well to respond to this. So <coughs> the fourth IR framework as well, so that for this digital skill. So, um, yeah, that's that's it for now uh, for, okay. <laughs> for this discussion. Maybe we should add later on. Okay, before I go to Dr. Samantha Sharp, uh, who is with us uh, online, I'd like to do uh, to ask a short follow-up question. Because when you talk about TESTA, basically we're dealing with short courses, yeah. uh, training courses. But how flexible is TESTA in terms of adapting, adapting to, let's say, certain trends that become available? Um, we're trying to do that now with our uh, some of our programs. We have the micro-credential program. So that this is really a response to the upskilling and reskilling, especially for those industries that have are they're really changing very quickly so that we can it's really for the upscaling of those in the IT in the IT sector those in the electronics so that we can, we are really responding to them um we are trying to also those I know um some of you would, would say that some have experience with this uh, we took it took us uh, I think about a year to develop uh, standards because we also do this with the industry but with this um to really respond to this we're doing now the adopt and adopt framework so looking at all the existing standards now um we're looking at the world skills standard so that it's something that's already there that will just uh, adapt to what we are we can really use uh, at the national level so those are the uh, things that we would want to be more so that we will be more flexible in terms of doing all of these standards and um, with our area-based approach um, there are things that uh, that are needed by the specific locality so what we do now is develop the competency standards so it's a shorter uh, duration I mean in terms of development so that's very specific so that's 
something that's really uh, we're doing so that um, we're not be doing the full regulations that would take us a year to develop. And then when we develop it, it's already obsolete. <laughs> That was what I was trying to drive at because <laughs> bureaucracy might uh, <laughs> might spoil everything. Okay, let's go to Dr. Uh, Samantha Sharp. In your work in sustainability and circularity in the textile and garment industry, which particular trends have you observed and uh, how do you see digit digitization affecting these trends? Sure, thank you. And just to say it's a pleasure to be with you um, virtually today. Um, I would say sustainability and circularity are really dominant trends in the textile and garment sector. Um, you know, it's the garment sector is is one of the most complex and globalised supply chains of any commodity uh, across the world. And we think it's, you know, was the, the reason for the Industrial Revolution. It was one of the first to globalise and it's really played uh, a unique role in um, economic development. And it employs a lot of people, so mainly women as well, uh, directly about 75 million. But if we took a value chain approach, um, so including all the growing of producing of raw materials all the way through to retail and also dealing with waste, textiles and garments, which is now very important, it's probably about 400 million people worldwide. So that's one in eight workers. So we're talking about a massive sector that really um, – has has a critical impact on the sustainable development of many countries. Um, and, you know, it's not without its problems. We all kind of know a lot of the social and environmental challenges and uh, being able to adopt sustainability and circularity are really testing this, this sector because, you know, one of the reasons it's been so successful is the, the long and complex supply chains, many countries involved, that make circularity and sustainability important, uh, difficult. Um, also the business model, so high volume, low cost, fast fashion. Um, so if we think about sustainability, it's so using less resources, reducing environmental impacts, achieving the SDGs, and circularity is, I guess, one aspect of doing that. So it's, um, as the colleague earlier talked about you know it's really changing the way that we use materials so that they cycle through rather than we have this linear take make dispose that materials will actually cycle so we won't have waste uh, byproducts of one sector will become inputs for another reuse uh, resale repurposing will also become more, much more important so if we think about those types of activities they require us to have new new information and new knowledge um, so if you're a garment company then you want to become circular you need to have really detailed information about what's in your inputs what fabrics how were they made what thread was used um, so you have to have a really good uh, relationship with your supplier and you also have to have a really good relationship with your customers because if you want to achieve circularity through extended producer responsibility you have to be able to offer them extra services about repair or resale. Uh, you need to know where they are and where that product is. And so digitalization enables a lot of these activities. Um, you know, out of the European Union and their sustainable textiles, we're starting to talk about a, a, a product passport, which is essentially a digital passport that says what's in different products and how they were made. Uh, so that means everyone along the supply chain can can um can know what's in those products and develop their circular strategies um they can also digitalization can also help uh with reducing materials so can enable new business models such as on-demand production and so that can um you know eliminate or minimize kind of those uh production overruns which uh creates a lot of waste um can also help us deal with some of the, the labour aspects, uh, social sustainability aspects in the, in the uh, supply chain. So enable greater supply chain transparency um, so we can know where things were made and we can know uh, who the workers were and whether they were paid, um, you know, good, good salaries. Um, and that can hopefully enable some more sustainable procurement and sourcing strategies. Um, Digitalization can also have downsides. Um, 
I don't know if many people are familiar with the ultra fast fashion models, but these are essentially driven by digital platforms. Um, and so this can be increasing consumption, kind of making it harder for us to introduce circularity. Um, and it's also complex um, and requires new skills and capabilities. So again, how do we develop those in a, a really large and complex supply chain, which includes you know, a wide spectrum of actors, you know, international brands through to SMEs. So how do we ensure that um, digital capabilities uh, or opportunities to develop those are equally shared? Okay, thank you, Samantha. By the way, after this round, we'll be entertaining questions from the uh, audience. So get ready with your questions. Let's now go to uh, Ms. Aquino. Let's talk about the uh, tourism and hospitality uh, sector. So how basically... Is the sector fading in terms of uh, green and the digital economy? Okay, thank you very much. Just uh, let's talk numbers first. In terms of GDP, uh, tourism actually contributed around 6.2%. In terms of employment, we're around like the share is around 11.2, uh, which translates to around 5.4 million. Uh, if you're talking about higher education institutions, they're like close to a thousand higher education institutions that actually offer tourism and hospitality programs with a combined enrollment of around 200,000, close to 300,000 students. So that's, that's the breadth and width of the industry. In terms of uh, green and digital uh, economy or uh, initiatives that we have, we're very happy to see that uh, the DOT has actually uh, made this made it already part of their accreditation standards. And so this is something that schools must bear in mind. Unfortunately, though, the policies, policy standards and guidelines, which are program standards and guidelines for the curriculum of tourism, uh, is already more than five years old. It was 2017 when we rolled it out. I'm now using my hat as a member of the technical committee. But it doesn't really... Uh, limit any school in making sure that course uh, outlines are actually updated every year. The biggest transition really happened in 2020 with COVID. A lot of uh, hotels, a lot of restaurants, and a lot of travel agencies have incorporated uh, uh, new processes. There were a lot of digital transformation that happened. A lot of green initiatives have happened already. And so it is now very incumbent in many schools to actually make sure that the faculty members are aware of these new initiatives to make sure that these are inputted into the curriculum, into the uh, daily uh, uh, classes that they have. Um, many of the faculty members, though, uh, may not have as much connection in industry or may not even have industry experience at that. And so the books that they use may not be rich in this in its initiatives right now. And so whenever I go for any opportunity to discuss or to be a speaker, if you're using books that are reference materials that are older than 2020, you've got to junk it already because then it's outdated because schools are supposed to represent what industry has. You prepare them for what eventually will be the jobs or maybe the uh, business prospects that they will have. Uh, tourism is, uh, I think, very... Uh, I was uh, listening to the discussion about what dirty jobs, uh, clean jobs, etc. The, uh, the, the the tourism is actually what. Uh, multi-industry. You don't think of the tourism industry as just the hotels or just the food and beverage. They have a lot of uh, products and services that come from different uh, industries, like textile, like uh, products, etc. And so they have. We have to make sure that. Everyone is into the same mindset to make sure that students are aware as early on when they're still in school. Uh, I was just looking at the numbers from DepEd all the way to uh, technical, vocational, and higher education. DepEd has around 26 million students uh, uh, from around 10 or 12,000 million schools, 12,000 schools. Uh, with free education at that, the curriculum really has to be very strong as early as uh, basic education. Uh, remember that the output of basic education is the input now for te technical vocational or for higher education. So if it's not strong, if it's not present as early as basic education, you'll have to start from step one in higher education, which again, um, 
uh, already is a very big challenge because you've got a lot of courses that you put in in higher education alongside professional subjects, general education, etc. Uh, I was just looking at the curriculum and I was saying to uh, Sir uh, Pelayo earlier on that we think in silos. This is just going to be my subject. This is going to be my course, etc. But when you talk about like Currently, sustainable tourism is one subject in higher education, specifically in tourism. But if you take a look at sustainable tourism, it is not just the job of maybe a tourism travel tourism officer. It's the job of everyone, whether you're in front office, in house cook, housekeeping, in food and beverage services, in travel agencies, etc. Everybody has to have a finger in sustainable tourism, digital transformation, and so on. So tourism... I think is uh, faring well because we've got to make sure that the numbers are there, but there has to be a lot of push really, not just from, as somebody said, it's not government is going to be doing it. It's also private. And so private has to also bring their, uh, uh, their marshals to court to make sure that industry is able to say, this is what we need and education should listen. We cannot just work outside with uh, work within our sector and i'm very happy that tourism is very fortunate to have what we call the convergence uh, the dot brought along form a convergence of uh, dept ed technical vocational skills development authority representatives together with higher education and the tourism industry board foundation incorporated which is a industry board for tourism and we're working alongside to make sure that the curriculum uh, the initiatives are actually brought in as early on in basic education all the way to higher education. I hope I answered your question more than. <laughs> more than answered the question. Thank you very much for that very comprehensive response. Let's now go to Sherwin. Let's talk about the trends uh, in data analytics and artificial intelligence and which of these trends can be most useful to the workforce in terms of the green and digital transition. I think that's very uh, simple to answer. It's generative AI. I mean, that's the, the inner thing. If I ask everyone in this room who has not used chat GPT, no one will probably raise the, their hands. Um, in, our, uh, in a recent study that we, that Access Partnership did uh, with AAP and uh, Microsoft, uh, we, um, it's the, the, the title of the paper, the economic impact of generative AI in the Philippines. There was an estimated $79.3 billion dollars of productive capacity that can be unlocked by AI. When you say productive capacity, it means actually the reduction of you know, manual work because of the automation that generative AI uh, can bring. So that it actually really helps us be more efficient in the way that we are uh, doing. What it does also say is that um, it doesn't really have to replace you know, workers, it just have to, we just have to shift our focus on the, the, the work that we are doing. We're talking about dirty jobs, you know, the only people that can really clean the dirty jobs are those in that sector uh, as well. So they really just have to use, you know, tools such as, you know, ChatGPT, you know, any generative AI tool to clean those dirty uh, jobs. Um, so we're actually working with TESDA a lot, uh, um, CHED uh, and, and DepEd. I was going to comment earlier about Charlene, you know, mentioning about, you know, how fast we can actually create competency standards now. Um, and I actually owe TESDA some work. Uh, but <laughs> we're actually creating competency standards in data analytics fundamentals and even prompt engineering. And what is used to take about a year, we're actually compressing it about one and a half months. So we're going to release competency standards already on prompt engineering and data analytics fundamentals. Um, and it's not only going to be for those who are going to develop products because we need users also of AI to know all of these things, okay? Um, we, we want to decrease the digital divide by having these AI tools available to everyone, not just the, the technical uh, people. But on the other hand, um, the use of uh, this tool should also have 
um, some we, we need to put in some efficient use of these tools. You know, Susan showed some um, kind of the, the negative impacts of generative AI. They use so much um, uh, computing power. Energy consumption is very high. Uh, the use of water to cool those machines are pretty high. Uh, Chat GPT actually is estimated to emit 8.4 tons of carbon dioxide. Uh, and that's more than twice what a human would uh, do in, you know, uh, in, in a year's time. So imagine if every one of us use ChatGPT uh, or there are more companies who are going to use generative AI. It's like putting in twice the number of people in the, plan in the, the planet. And, you know, as we know, we, we cannot do that anymore. You know, our, our planet can do that. So the efficient use of these tools is very important uh, as well. It's not important that you just need to type, okay, I need this, uh, create me an outline for um, um, uh, the, the best um, uh, replacement for plastics, okay? One question in chat GPT would already use so much computing uh, power that it'll affect the environment. Prompt engineering is not just about grammar or proficiency in linguistics. You know, you need to put in the context of what you need uh, chat GPT. You need to be very, very specific. So you could use chat GPT for as the shortest time uh, uh, possible. Uh, for those of us who have been, you know, um, I think experienced programming in mainframe and I'm looking at Mon. You know, during the time when we were taught about programming, we were taught about the rigor of programming. And we actually count the number of times we compile our programs in the mainframe because using mainframe is very, very expensive. So I think it's going to be similar to us. Even if we have all of these automated tools, we need to be very, very efficient in the use of these tools as well. So that's quite an oxymoron. I think that was mentioned uh, earlier during the <laughs> discussion. This one fleshes it out uh, even more. Uh, we'll entertain questions from the crowd, from the audience, but first we'll uh, entertain questions from the Fuller Hall. So how do we go about it? We'll... Okay. Are there questions from uh, the Fuller Hall? Okay, I think they're still fixing the... Yes. The tech okay. issues. Uh, any question from the from the audience? Okay. All right, ready now. All right, now. Hello. Yes. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, please Hello. introduce yourself first. Okay. All right. Um, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Uh, okay. Um, I'm Palma from uh, from PIA, and this is the question. I think this is more on the the previous speakers. However, uh, this will be the the concern. Um, we all know that uh, labor and um, Operational costs are, are high when we talk about a circular economy, particularly in the, the Philippines. So what will be the recommendation of the speaker when it comes to promoting this type of economy, considering this, um, these barriers, especially uh, when it comes to the manufacturing industry and um, other related industries that is also uh, high in uh, manpower and uh, Operational cost. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that question. Um, anybody would like to get the first crack or? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Doctor Ilya. Thank you so much. Uh, okay. I think the the circular transition would would actually provide that answer, because as I mentioned earlier, uh, the circular uh, models of the economy is, is actually more uh, labor in uh, less labor intensive compared to the linear models. 
Therefore, if companies are able to uh, uh, resort to using circular models okay, in their operations, I think that the reduction in labor costs would, would, would come as a result of that. And because primarily uh, of the of the 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 technologies involved, right, in, in, in the transition. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, anybody else would like to respond to that? How about Dr. Sharp in the context of the garments and textile uh, industries? Sure, yes. Um, and I think that's circular is initially going to be more expensive, uh, definitely. And but I think um what what many organizations learn is you can't be circular by yourself. You have to be circular in a sector, in an economy, in a geography. And so um, really to, I guess, unlock the benefits of circularity, you need that supply chain governance or that, those strategies at a city scale or a country scale that enable those connections to be made because until they're, they're there and, you know, it's really important that intermediaries um, such as the new the new center that was has been announced help de-risk and help build information and new knowledge that enables uh different companies to make the steps towards circularity but you know it will be costly to begin with and but there's also advantages around first mover uh innovation so there's there's both benefits uh as as well as costs okay thank you uh, dr sharp uh other questions from the audience you can now entertain questions from this hall. Anybody? None yet? Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, let's move to the uh, next round of questions here. Uh, let's uh, start with uh, Ms. Uh, Hustim Bastem. So, which particular sectors are critical in the Philippine green and digital economy? And what skills and training gaps must be addressed to prepare workers for this? Um. Based on our workforce skills survey, the, uh, the skills is anticipation. So it, uh, we're looking at the renewable energy, um, sustainable agriculture, and ecotourism are becoming, they are, I think, they're critical uh, sectors that we should be looking at. So we are uh, developing more programs for this since these are identified also as, uh, we have identified some of the emerging uh, skills and in-demand skills for this particular uh, 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 sectors that are really we're looking at green. Um, also, in terms of the digital economy, so we see, of course, this in the IT, the data analytics, the cybersecurity, the ones that we're also doing, and um, these are the uh, the cybersecurity skills, as I mentioned. So um, we are doing some of the the ones that we are developing now for this, as I mentioned, the ones that are really more responsive and agile. So we're doing some micro-credential courses for this and some uh, competency standards. Uh, specifically for the uh, renewable energy, we have uh, recently developed now a competency standards for the fully powered, uh, fully uh, powered, uh, battery powered uh, electric vehicle uh, level two. Uh, service, servicing level two. So that's one uh, that's one response that we have now for the electric vehicle app. And um, we have uh, already in embedded some of the green competencies in some of our 89 training regulation. And this would also include, of course, uh, the common uh, the green components in terms of also the, uh, preparedness, I mean, 5S, uh, the, the ones that are also being uh, asked by that uh, occupational safety, so it's being included there. And uh, we have a solar powered and uh, solar powered and uh, solar powered training regulations as well. And um, with the green Tibet framework, so um, we have uh, we have this uh, implemented among our institutions since Tessa has 178 training technology training institutions, and we have tried to really um, make them uh, adhere to this green Tibet framework by looking at their standards, um, the adhering to green competencies that such as they are also doing it in their institutions. Um, we have, I think some innovations there would be having their solar powered uh, irrigation system in some of their uh, these trading institutions for agriculture and the tourism. So um, somehow um, this uh, development and Aside from this, of course, I would like to, that part of the priorities, of course, are these 
priority sectors that we have already identified. Um, this uh, we have developed this, and we have embedded some of the competency standards. And we have a, we are also part of the Green Jobs Act. So part of that is we have to include uh, the in the curriculum these green competencies. So aside from embedding green competencies in the curriculum, we also have to develop skills to respond to the green jobs and identify these green jobs. Uh, with our with the support of the interagency and with the dole so i think um somehow we're we're, we're in the right track and um in terms of the of the, the green uh, digital um we are work, we will be working on having uh, we're doing the digital roadmap as well in terms of not only for internally but of course for the whole sector so we're looking at that for the whole tvet sector so um yeah, for the government. It's just that um, all of this we will be doing with, with a lot of help, not just for with us, but uh, as, I, as mentioned by uh, Martina and Sherwin here, we have strengthened the industry board so that we will be able to work with them in terms of all of this emerging and uh, in demand that we, that, so that we could really respond to what uh, the industry would be needing for the digital and the green. Okay, there's a question for you from uh, Zoom, but before I read that question, yeah. I'll go to Sherwin first. Uh, you mentioned the benefits of artificial intelligence. I think it's quite obvious. Uh, one example that I thought of while you, while you were talking about it, I heard that retailers are actually making practical use of AI in terms of copywriting. Let's say they want to advertise their uh, merchandise online, so they just have to type what they need. And AI, chat GPT, would do the copywriting. So that saves time. But again, that comes at a high cost to the environment. I mean, can you talk about certain... Um, short-term, at least immediate ways that we can do to be able to somehow cushion the impact of the use of such beneficial technology on the environment? I think it's really learning how to use efficiently these uh, tools. Um, prompt engineering, again, um, I think, well, prompt engineering unlocked really the this generative AI tools for everyone uh, to see. So I think we really just need to be conscious first um, um, that yes, uh, these are very, very helpful tools, but they do have some effects on, on the uh, environment because of the, the, the computing resources that uh, they need. So it's imperative for us to learn how to properly use these tools. I mean, I use ChatGPT, for example, to, to create outlines for presentations. Um, before ChatGPT, it was very important for, for me or for, for those who, who teach, right? We, we need to know, okay, what's the objective of the presentation? Who is the target audience? How long do I have? Okay, Those are the basic questions that we, we do when we present. It's going to be the same thing here. If you actually provide the context, the topic, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the audience, okay? uh, the, the, the mode of presentation, um, do you want to be more professional, more uh, jovial, for example, in your, your presentations? And you put that in one line in, in ChatGPT, it will definitely save a lot of computing resources. So with just one uh, statement, okay, with all of the things that we, we are, we, we are, you know, we use, uh, we use to do normally, okay, it saves time. Of course, you can do that one prompt at a time. But again, every time that you create a, a prompt, that's going to generate again some effects in the, in the uh, environment. That's actually new knowledge for me. <laughs> I'm going to cascade that information. So try to save uh, energy <laughs> by asking everything in one, one prompt. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let's now go to Ms. Aquino. So how do you see the hospitality industry evolving to become more resilient in the green and digital economy? Oh, we have to make sure that we are on top of things. How many of you have stayed in a hotel for like more than three nights? More than three nights. How many of you have seen notices on the table that would say, if you don't want your towels to be changed, hang it? You've seen that. Yeah. How many of you have experienced on the following day, your towels have been changed, even if you put yeah. it up there? So what training do we need? Training is needed to make sure that everyone who is part of the system uh, is knowledgeable about the initiatives that you have. So just like a typical hotel, you've got somebody, the big bosses maybe think of, okay, let's save on uh, uh, washing of towels. They do not translate it to training to the staff. And so 
even if there is a green initiative already that you have in the hotel, the staff are not aware of the value or maybe the reason, the objective of this. And so it has to go from the top all the way to the bottom. We've got to make sure also digital transformation. I remember, you know, I finished my program in 1980. <laughs> took my practicum then and when we were working in the hotel preparing for a guest arrival you'd have to type out type out several you know carbonized paper etc etc and uh, it was really very consuming in terms of time in terms of materials that we had but right now with a uh, property management system there's no need to actually type print out all of these materials. You can just easily use any system. In fact, there are some that are licensed, some that are free. But what you need to do is make sure that the students are aware of this. Uh, it saves on labor because you know, a lot of people are scared that, oh, their jobs are going to be at risk if they embrace digital transformation. But I keep saying that, I keep telling everyone, it actually affords you now to have a relationship with guests. Because instead of, you know, typing, being busy, doing so many things, oh, Mr. So-and-so, you have been with us. Uh, how was it in the last two months? We haven't seen you because the data is already there in your, in your computer. You're able to say, would you like the same room? Would you like the same? You know, if you are familiar with your guests and you have all of this information at the back, you've got to, you you already have everything uh, at your fingertips. And all you have to do is make sure that the guest actually feels very welcome in your facility. So we've got to make sure that we embrace this. We're not going back to what it was in 1980. We've got to move forward. And these things are, you know, uh, even destinations. Uh, I was going in, I went to a destination. I said, how many years has this been uh, existing? Uh, wait, a, wait a minute, mom. And, you know, so the, you know, you've got an external brain already that helps you provide information. Uh, I've seen, I've spoken to some editors where they actually accept uh, chat GPT, gen uh, AI generation generated research, but the onus of making sure that everything that you put in your paper is something that is valid, that goes through extensive validation to make sure that you can still put your name to that particular paper. So there is a lot of things that moving. If we don't move, you're going to be left behind and all your competitors will move forward. You're left behind. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for that. We're going to end in uh, five minutes. Um... <laughs> So one more question for Dr. Sharp, and then we'll have one final question for all our panel members. Uh, the question for you, Dr. Sharp, is uh, do you see a role for digitization in sustainability transitions in the labor market? And perhaps you can also talk briefly about the barriers, uh, let's say in terms of uh, achieving the circular economy in the textile and garments industry. And perhaps you can mention uh, certain barriers that you have observed in the Philippines. Okay. Sure. Uh, yes, digitization can absolutely help. Uh, and, you know, there will be labor market impacts. So help in sustainability transitions. You know, there's there'll be new opportunities, lots of discussion of those already, new jobs, new ways of working, um, and also opportunities to have more sustainable business models or um, practices. So whether that's, you know, hanging the towel up or using... Um, you know, buying secondhand clothing. Um, and, we, you know, we can also develop uh, skills in, in more, um, as, as the colleague from Tesla said, you know, having ability, digitalization gives us ability to develop online learning in new customised ways, accessible, affordable, quickly, uh, and that's something that we'll need if we are going to, um, you know, get the workforce ready for the green transition. Um, I guess one of the main ways that digitalization has um, impacted in sustainability in the textile and garment sector is particularly in enabling um, in innovation and entrepreneurship with small uh, garment manufacturers, such as in, in the Philippines, garment manufacturers and designers. So oh. these can be small um uh, designers or brands that can really use digital platforms to get that global reach. And so they can reach customers that are really demanding those sustainable um, aspects of garment production in a way that that wasn't possible uh, earlier on. So I guess that's kind of one of the, the main areas where we've seen 
um, sustainable garments be able to, uh, you know, scale with uh, digital platforms. Okay, thank you very much. Now, the final question for our all our panel members uh, is this. Given that the Philippine labor market is polarized and workers considerably differ in skills and training, what key policies should be pursued to ensure just, equitable, and sustainable transitions? So we'll start with Dr. Sharp. Oh, okay. Uh, it's you great. again. Yes. <laughs> um, yes, I think the, the whole concept of just transition needs to be front and centre in, in kind of thinking about how um, this transition plays out in the labour market. So ensuring that Yes, we do transition, but we do it in a way that no one is left behind. And so that means, you know, having that broad-based approach to digital literacy, um, paying attention to the gender dimensions of, of the transition as well. Um, you know, lots of points about policy coherence and coordination. You're very much in the front uh, of that, I, I would say, with the Green Jobs Act. It's very much the... Uh, admired from uh, some of your compatriot countries uh, in ASEAN. So I think you've got a lot of good things to build from. Um, but, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Sharp. We'll now hear from uh, Ms. Aquino. Uh, sorry. Uh, I guess one number one would be uh, collaboration. You, there has to be strong collaboration, not just with academia, but government, as well as industry, to make sure that what industry needs is actually uh, implemented in school, or if it needs the support of government, maybe some strategy or some, some uh, circular can be done. You've got to make sure also that your curriculum is very updated. Uh, never mind if the training regulation, the curriculum guides, or the PSGs are like five years old. There is still a way that you can update your curriculum. How? By making sure that the course content is actually something that can be checked every year. I remember some faculty members who would have their, their materials, uh, what's this, uh, yellowed already because they've not changed their content in a number of years. So I guess faculty immersion is also very important because they know, you know, you cannot teach what you do not have and sometimes the only companion the teachers would have would be books and so you've got to make sure that you're also immersed in industry i'm very happy to say that state universities and colleges right now are beneficiaries of a step up grant which is actually 25 million worth and it allows them to actually enhance their, uh, their facilities do uh, research do uh what's this uh immersion etc but i think i, I guess the biggest hurdle is uh, equipment. And so many of them are focusing on that. But the thing is, you've got to make sure that you're on top of what industry needs. And you can't do that by just working with your, within your group. You've got to make sure that you're part of a bigger system, whether a professional organization, part also of maybe TIBFI, the Tourism Industry Board Foundation Incorporated, or any professional organization. Mind you, I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Beth Aragon, who is actually now the Secretary of the Tourism Industry Board Foundation Incorporated, together with uh, Dr. A Professor Alan Tang as well. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now go to uh, Sherwin. Um, I think in, in alignment with um, Ma'am Christina and um, Charlene here, um, in, in the theme of uh, human capital development and, you know, not really wasting any uh, effort or duplication of efforts for, you know, the going uh, green, uh, there is this, you know, initiative within DTI and DIC on the creation of the Philippine skills uh, framework. Um, the, the intent is to really define career paths competencies and proficiency levels for major sectors. We already have skills framework for supply chain logistics, uh, human resource development, um, game, anim uh, game development, animation. We're going to have a Philippine skills framework for analytics and artificial intelligence. What it allows us is that it, it's, it's a very agile, you know, adaptive skills framework that you know, educational institutions, even TVET can actually use to define what are the, 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 the training uh, needs, okay? So that ties up nicely with the Philippine Qualifications uh, Framework. And uh, I think I'm, I'm happy to actually hear that there's already an, an agreement, I think, between TESDA and CHED about the Philippine Credit Transfer System, which is also, I guess, again, in in the theme of not putting to waste whatever training you have. You know, whatever you might have trained in, in Tibet might be 
accredited in a uh, higher education uh, program. Okay, so um, I think with, with those, you know, once we implement those in our education program, you know, at least um, we will have very more efficient, you know, uh, education for, for the country. Thank you, Sherwin. Then finally, uh, Sherlene, but before that, uh, we'll try to squeeze in, squeeze in this question from Zoom. Uh, can TESDA create a competency training program for digitalized cultural mapping? Um, yes. Okay, go ahead. It's then the, the, the final question. Creatives and go ahead. The IBS. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, this, this has been mentioned that we have to pursue collaboration. So that's, I think, one very important thing for us in the government, um, uh, especially for TESDA. Um, we have, I mentioned that we have been working with this, with my co-panelists here uh, for the tourism and for the analytics. And I, I think we cannot really overemphasize with this discussion. Um, we, we need our people. So we need human capital development. And so we really have to uh, invest invest in them. So part of that is really developing uh, the requirements of the industry so that they could really um, find work and also not just find work, but of course also contributing to the economy, both, I mean, the requirements for the digital and the green. So with that, um, we will be uh, pursuing all of these uh, policies that in which Tibet played a, plays a very important role. Um, uh, the Philippine Qualifications Framework. We have the Philippine Skills Framework, which uh, which is also an input to what we are doing in terms of really identifying the, the requirements that we need to develop for the industry in a particular industry. So um, we will also be aligning, of course, we have the NTSDP. So that's the plan in which we will be operationalizing by the development of the regional and provincial plans, which we will be doing such a way that it's really an operational plan. Um, we will be having the skills mapping because we have the, I mentioned about the area-based demand-driven event in which we are really doing it at the local level. So identifying the specific skills requirements. So this, the regional and provincial plan will really be the skills map requirements of the particular uh, locality uh, and addressing also of course the in the, the particular sector industry in that particular area so moving forward those are the plans that we have for the tivet sector um remember um the, the ntsdp the plan is not just it's, it's not a test the plan so this is for the whole tivet sector so that's why we need all of them our stakeholders in terms of really doing uh implementing such uh, all of the programs, the strategies that we have identified in that plan. So uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Uh, I mean, TESDA and in, in engaging us in this conversation. Okay. So thank you very much to our panelists. So that ends our second panel session for today. Uh, please be back at uh, 1.30.